Thank you. Please take your seats. Welcome to New Life Community Church. On behalf of all of our elders, our pastors, our staff and leaders, we're so grateful that we can spend this morning with you and to just worship God together. For those of you joining us online, welcome also. We extend to you a great big hug and a big greeting. We're grateful that even though we can't be together in person, we're together, we're worshiping in one spirit. And it's in that spirit that we're going to continue on this sermon series that we've been on called The Road to the Kingdom. I want to take a moment and just say thank you to Pastor Brian McDaniel who filled us in last week on that incredible uh, beatitude, uh, being pure in heart. We're going, to, we're going to continue building on that. Thank you, Pastor Brian, for being so faithful in your studies and for sharing with us. Um, I, I want to share with you that Pastor Brian took another step. He also preached in Spanish service, so our pastor's speaking in tongues, I think, a little bit there. <laughs> he did a great job. Listen, we're going to jump into this next beatitude, and I'm going to just ask for your consideration in this way. Today's sermon, this beatitude, in my personal opinion, is harder to preach than any of the others. We already know that the Sermon on the Mount is one of the most famous of all Jesus' teachings. People from different religions, non-religious, everyone says the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, those are things you can live by. And everyone talks highly about them, but very few people actually live them out. And if there was any one that was more difficult for us to live out, of all of these that we're studying, it's this one. And so as your pastor, as your friend, I'm going to ask that you be very patient and, and, and listen carefully. Listen to what I'm saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. This will have some bit of discomfort for some of us. And because of that, I teach two Bible studies during the week, one of which is Tuesday night Bible study. It's called Light of the Night. And I am going to dedicate a part of that time just opening up some conversation about what I'm going to teach you today. Because some of you will walk out asking really good questions. Does Pastor Lewis mean to say this? And there will be lots of them. And I don't want you to walk away confused. So we're going to spend Tuesday night discussing some of the questions that will come up. You will question some of the things I say because it goes against your nature. And I understand that. But today, I just want to be a faithful pastor. I want to preach God's word. I want to let the Holy Spirit teach. And we'll work with whatever's left over, okay? Would you give me that grace to just speak and then give me the grace to speak afterwards? We'll get through whatever this is. So after that big old buildup, it's time for a good sermon, huh? We'll see. Well, we know that the Sermon on the Mount is a culmination of the teachings of Jesus Christ. It wasn't just one sermon that happened one spot. Matthew and Luke, in Luke it's called the Sermon on the Plain, but they have brought together a culmination of all the studies, of all the teachings that Jesus shared as he traveled. So when he was in Caesarea, when he was in Philippi, when he was in Judea, when he was in Galilee, these were the lessons that he was repeating, repeating, and repeating. And we're getting them in a con condensed dose here in chapter 5 through chapter 7 of the Gospel of Matthew. One of the things that I'm trying really hard to teach you is this. And I don't want you to believe that I'm just being negative or attacking others. There have been some critical variances in how we approach Scripture. And, and, and as long as the Lord allows me, I want to correct certain approaches to studying the Scriptures and understanding the Scriptures. There are many religions, many ways to approach God's Word, but I just want to make sure that you have a solid foundation as to how we understand them. And one of the things I, I, I want to bring to your mind is to, rem to remind you that Jesus, even though our culture is very individualistic, it, it, it's very preoccupied with self, the ego. You know, how do you feel about Jesus? Have you accepted Christ? Are, are you ready to make your decision? And, it, and it's very personal, and, and it is. But when we listen to the teachings of Jesus, he wasn't a you kind of person. He was a we kind of person. 
He didn't come teaching about how you feel. He came teaching about how we would feel. What you would do, but what we would do. And he called it the kingdom teaching. Jesus came to prepare a kingdom. And in this Sermon on the Mount, these first four weeks where we ch were challenged with, you know, the, the, the first four, we were taught how you get into this kingdom. Because the teachings of this kingdom and the way of this kingdom is different than any other kingdom on earth. And you can't get into it by merit, by purchasing, by manipulation, by somehow finding worth in your, in your actions that you deserve it. No. He says, to enter this kingdom, you must be poor in spirit. You need to recognize that you are a poor, lost sinner. And that it is only by the grace and mercy of God that you can enter. And, and, and we, we mourn, we cry, we, 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 we struggle over the effect that sin has had in our lives. And we find the humility to know He is God and we are not. Can you amen that? And so we, we continue to learn that blessed are those who mourn and we're saddened. And, and then we find, yes, we're strong, but we're called to be meek. Even though you're bright and you're intelligent and you're beautiful and you have all these things going for you, because we're poor in spirit, because we are, are, are mourning, we submit to God. And we are power under control. And we say, God, you are the Lord. I am not. Therefore, I submit to you. I humbly become your slave and, and, and the more that I do that, I begin to create in myself a hunger and a thirst for His righteousness. And when I'm in that place of humility, of submission, of desiring Him, of understanding my place, He says, now you're ready to enter into the kingdom. And then we get into the next four Beatitudes. And, and now that you're in the kingdom, this is what God expects of you because you're just not going to sit there. There's things that you should expect. There's certain actions that God requires of you. If you're going to represent the king, then you will represent him correctly. You will represent him the way he wants to be represented. And I'm, I'm grateful for Pastor Brian when he shared with us uh, on, on how we're to come to him. And, and we shared about being merciful, and Pastor Brian talked about being pure in heart, that we can't have other gods. We can't divide our loyalty. We need to be pure towards our walk with Christ. That's required of us. No one should compete for God's place in your heart. But now we get to the big one. Allow me to read it to you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. If we are to be citizens of this kingdom, if we are to properly represent the king, then he says that we are to be called peacemakers. And, and this is important. Man, if I could only have a week just on this one alone, but I'm going to give it my best. I think the best way to understand this is if I share with you a moment in the life of Christ where he exemplifies exactly what this beatitude is teaching. So I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. Luke, chapter 19. And we're going to begin reading in verse 28. If you open your Bibles to Luke 19, 28, you're going to find that in many of your Bibles, I'm using an English Standard Version, it's already entitled for you, the triumphant entry, or the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. In this chapter, Luke 19, chapter 28 and on, I want to give you a little context. This is speaking and describing the last week of Jesus' life. It's the, the last week of his life on earth. He has been teaching for just a little under three years. He's nearing the age of 33. He's been teaching, and now he's coming back. He's left Galilee. He's come down, and he's going into Jerusalem for the last week of his life, the Passion Week. This week is special because it's also the time of one of the most important feasts of Israel, the Feast of Passover. So this town called Jerusalem, normally it's inhabited anywhere from 20 to 40,000 people on this specific week. They will get a minimum of 400,000 people visiting. So this 20 to 40,000 people are is now going to be well near half a million people. Some have said even more, up to a million. 
So all of these people are now converging. The, sh the shops are filled. The streets are filled. The market is filled. There is humanity everywhere. This is going to be an important, important week. And Jesus is coming down, and he's arriving close to Jerusalem. One little point I want to make, so it, it, it's going to help me as we go through. The city of Jerusalem, any of you ever heard of it before? Raise your hand if you heard of Jerusalem. Well, I, I, I want you to understand something. This is going to help me put it together. When Jesus was born, true, not true, he was called the Prince of Peace. He was prophesied to be the Prince of Peace. True or not true? True. He's the Prince of Peace. And he was baptized. He, he began to be accompanied by the Dove of Peace, the Holy Spirit. True, not true? It's true. And he's talking about a kingdom where he will be king and he will be called the King of Peace. And where will he govern? In the New Jerusalem. What does Jerusalem mean? The name Jerusalem, when you look at it in Hebrew, is made of two words, Yaru and Shalom. Yaru means city. Shalom means peace. So Jerusalem is what? The city of peace. You have the prince of peace that will one day be king of peace, accompanied by the dove of peace, entering the city of peace. Are you catching the theme yet? And it is the last week of Jesus' life, and the streets are filled with people, and Jesus has come down. He's on the Mount of Olives, and Luke in chapter 19 is going to bring all our attention here. So join me in Luke 19, verse 28. It says, and when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he, knew, when he drew near Bethphage and Bethany at the amount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. Now most of us that enjoy a good story are saying, oh, that's cute. I know this part. I've seen pictures. Jesus is going to ask for a little donkey, and the donkey becomes a star of the show, right? Well, let's take a moment. Here's Lewis, the pessimist that I am. I'm thinking to myself, Jesus, you just walked nearly 100 miles from Galilee down to Jerusalem. You have been walking through the mountains, through the valleys. You, you were crossing streams. You have been walking, and throughout the scriptures in your three-year ministry, all you did was walk. Here you're reaching the end of your ministry. You're right outside the city, and now you want a donkey. Does that make any sense to you? That donkey would have been really useful way earlier. Why now? And I want you to understand that Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. He's not tired. His, his back isn't hurting from the walk. No, he is about to make some theological and political points. I avoid politics like the plague when I preach. I don't want them to distract people from the word and the meaning of God's scripture. But today we will sound very political which is why it's so hard. Because I know that even in this room, we have various positions, various understandings. So remember, we, we, we agreed we're going to be gracious with one another. Amen? That was only like five of you. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're going to be gracious, and we're going to listen. And so Jesus is going to make some theological and political points, and he means to. He means to. This isn't an aside. It's a point. And he says, bring me a donkey. And one thing that brings, is brought to my attention, will, I will elaborate on later, is, is this donkey, this colt, one that has ever yet had anyone sit on it. It's not broken. This is a donkey that if you try to sit on it, it's going to buck you. It's going to kick you. It will not obey you. It will not, you will not be able to find it very useful. But Jesus says, bring me that specific one, that one that hasn't been broken. I'm going to wait here on the Mount of Olives. And, and so we begin to ask the question, why would Jesus want a donkey? Well, we know from the scriptures that going back from different kings, it was customary for a king to enter into his city, and there would always be a parade. Now, what the king was mounted on, what he was sitting on, mattered. For instance, if a king was coming back victorious from war, he would be riding a white stallion, a great horse, or he would be on a chariot led by white horses, white stallions. And everyone would honor the conquering king. 
or if he was coming into a conquered land, he was coming in to establish his kingdom. He had by force and by war won the day, and you could not deny him his kingdom. He was the king. And Jesus has been hearing this from people for so long, and he's been rejecting it. Remember when he fed all those people the miracle of the bread, the loaves, and the fish? People were saying, be our king, Jesus, be our king. And Jesus said, no, I don't want to be your king. But now he's going to present himself as king. He understands the symbolism and the theological implications of what he's doing. If I was to ask you, how many of you know John 3.16? By the way, how many of you know John 3.16? That's great, because most Christians do. But what if I was to say, how many of you know Zechariah 9.9? One person. If you were to talk to Jewish people, Zechariah 9.9 was one of the most well-known scriptures. You know why? Because it was a promise from God that they would not always be under the heavy hand of an oppressive government. That they would not always be suffering death or poverty because of some other foreign government. God had promised them through all the captivities, the Assyrians, the Babylonians. He said, there is one that is coming he will be called the Messiah. And you will recognize this coming king who will take off all of the chains. He will unburden you from all of this oppressive power. And you will recognize him. How? Zechariah 9.9. Allow me to read it to you. He says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold your king, he is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Every Jewish person understood the symbolism. Jesus stopped his 90 mile walk and said, bring me a donkey. I'm going into town, and they are going to know why I'm coming. I've been preaching about a kingdom. I've been talking about a kingdom. I told them it was coming. I told them it was here. I told them it was in their midst. Well, the kingdom is here, and the king has arrived. And so the scriptures continue here. Let's, let's continue reading. And it, verse 31, If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? So that those who were sent away and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. Verse 35. And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of Jehovah the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The disciples ensure that he's seated, he's comfortable. They're on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is here. Here's the city of peace, Jerusalem. And Jesus is going to begin this walk down the mountain in through the front gates. Now what I want you to recognize is this. If a king came mounted on a stallion or a horse, he came by way of war. But if a king such as David his son Solomon before Jesus, if he came riding a donkey, it was a symbol of peace. That this king wanted no part of war. He didn't want to come in looking for trouble. He came because it was a peaceful situation. It was a calm situation. There was reason to rejoice because they were enjoying peace. So I want you to think for a second. Jesus is trying to make theological and political points. What kind of king will Jesus be? A, a king of war or a king of peace? A king of peace, right? And so, so he's coming down, he's coming down the mountain, and he's, he's coming in, and all of a sudden his disciples, they begin to sing. 
and they begin to rejoice. And I can almost imagine they are feeling really good about this day. They don't know what's in store for them. They don't know what's going on. But they begin to shout. And we learn from the other gospel narratives that they begin to shout, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. They're quoting Psalm 118, verse 26. They're saying, Hosanna! In the Hebrew, it means uh, save us. Save us. And it was a way of saying, we recognize you, King. We recognize you. Save us. Do something about these Romans. Do something about all of these strangers. Do something about our captivity. Save us. We are here to support you. And they start putting their cloaks on the road, making a carpet for the King that is coming into town. And some of the other narratives will bring out. They didn't just throw their cloaks on the ground. They had palm fronds. And, and I know, if you were to go to a Catholic church on the Holy Week, for instance, it's customary. I went to a Catholic church when I was a child, and, and they would give us palm fronds, and we would shape it in the form of a cross, and it was a way of celebrating Palm Sunday. And, and in some videos and pictures I've seen, people are holding palm fronds and they're waving them back and forth as, as the procession of Jesus and His donkey and His disciples come by. But what I think is happening here, remember I said it was Holy Week? Every family had gone out and they'd cut a palm frond. And it wasn't long, it was only about this long, maybe even shorter. And they would take it into their homes. And part of the preparation for Passover is using that frond is to find all the leaven in the home. They would take a spoon and they would leaven out their house. They would take out the leaven. And, and they would have these fronds. And, and, and it, I've read quite a few of, of the, those that have studied this. And, and there's a chance that what was happening outside was those were the fronds that the people had because they were purchasing them by the droves and as Jesus is coming into town they're laying their cloaks on the ground giving him a carpet upon which to walk and they're holding up their palm fronds as if they were swords and they're saying you are our king save us we are your soldiers we are your volunteers we will fight we will fight and we will fight until our enemies are conquered. We believe you to be the Messiah. We are ready to be your soldiers. We're ready for war. Are you following me here? This is why Jesus was making such a point to come in on a donkey. I'm going to make some points here that you might find offensive, and I don't mean to be offensive, but it's just my personal belief. Here's my personal belief, that when people get an idea in their head, it's hard to break them out of it especially when it's a religious idea, especially when our passions are connected to those ideas. Jesus is dealing with a group of people who is highly passionate about being patriots, about being freed from the shackles of the Romans, and they want to be free, and they're ready to fight, and they're ready to kill, they're ready to go to war. Jesus, lead us, and we will win. All for the glory of God. And Jesus will respond to this. I want you to listen in on verse 39 on. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples, a.k.a. shut them up. Make them stop. So we know the Pharisees have some issues. I'll tell you why in a second. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And verse 41... And when he drew near and he saw the city, he wept over it. He wept. Time out. If everyone is praising and singing and dancing and chanting and putting cloaks in the road and everybody is excited, maybe we should care that Jesus stops and begins to cry. I get it, Jesus. You're overwhelmed, aren't you? We are too. This is a good day. That's not the kind of weeping he's doing. He will answer the question, verse 42, saying, 
Would that you, all of you, every one of you that has put a cloak in my road, every one of you holding your palm frond, every one of you singing and dancing, every one of you quoting scripture, oh, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Someone should have paid attention to what he was saying. And so what happens is, is Jesus is coming in. They're all excited. You're the king. We're your army. We're going to war. You are going to fulfill Zechariah 9.9. 9. Psalm 119 is now appropriate. Hosanna, save us. And Jesus is like, y'all don't get it. I'm riding a donkey for a reason. I'm not here to lead you to war. I'm here to lead you to peace. I am the Prince of Peace, the King of Peace, coming into the city of peace. You all want war. And he begins to cry, and he has a moment that only the Son of God can. He, knowing the future at this point, he sees what lays ahead of him. We're talking here AD 30 time, you know, area. And Jesus knows that within 34, 35 years, this passion of peoples for war, it will not be settled. And there will be other messiahs, other people that will take Jesus' place. And they're going to say, I am the messiah. I will unshackle you from Rome. Let's go to war. And when they do that, we find that initially, A.D. 64 on, the Jewish people had some success. But by the time you get to A.D. 68, there's been a change in emperor, there's been a change in the political landscape, and Rome can now look at this tiny little city of Jerusalem and give it all its attention. And so Rome sends its fifth, its tenth, its seventh, its twelfth, its fifteenth legions. They come in with an incredible display of power. They surround the holy city. And for a couple of years, they keep everyone inside. If you ever read any of the historians, the people inside are starving. They're dying of thirst and disease. They're, I don't want to get into the specific. They're literally eating each other. And at the end of the day, Rome will burst in. The soldiers will burst in. Some of the most disciplined soldiers that the world has ever seen. A Roman centurion with his men. And all chaos ensues. There are writings from those that know the history that when the Romans broke in, they came into the temple and the leaders wanted to preserve the temple. It's one of the wonders of the world. It's got gold in the walls, silver, it's such beauty. And, and the leaders were, were told by Titus himself. They said... Do not harm this temple. Yes, get, you can ransack the city. You can, you can burn the... Don't touch the temple. And the Roman soldiers were so filled with hatred for the Jews, just as the Jews were so filled with hatred towards the Romans, that they no longer feared the centurion's bar, and they no longer obeyed their generals. And they came in. Some of the generals were saying, they sent their own personal guards saying, if any of our Roman soldiers do not obey, club them to death. They must obey. We will have order. They couldn't control it. Roman soldiers came in. They sacked the temple. They killed men, women, and children. Nearly a million people were killed that day. 90,000 others were taken as slaves. It is a horrible, horrible mark in the history of the Jewish nation because of the hatred that they had for each other. Jesus knew this. It's why he wept. He said, if you only knew the way of peace, because you all want war so bad, don't you know what war brings? Don't you understand the consequence of war? In preparation for this sermon, and I'm going off my notes right now, I struggled a lot. I'm trying to understand war. I read some Sun Tzu just talking about the art of war. I was wondering why a man dedicated to the art of war, you know what his main philosophy was? Avoid it at all costs. 
The best war is the war that you never have. I read pastors who who were preaching during the Second World War, one from the First World War, and each and every one of them was saying, this is the most horrible thing that can ever happen to humanity. And you know, as a pastor, I understand that we all have a nature. We have a sin nature. And so I've always thought, well, war comes natural to us. I mean, think about it. Do you have to teach babies and children how to fight? It comes natural. And so, but, but I was struggling with this because if it's so natural for us to go to war, then why are so many of my friends in the Army and the Marine Corps, why are they struggling with PTSD? Why are they going through traumas of what they've seen and what they've heard and what they've experienced? Why are people killing themselves over guilt of what they've done? Something doesn't sound natural to me. And one of the things that I've noticed, and also I heard this before, that some of our leaders, at least in my personal opinion, I prefer a leader, a government leader who was serving in the military previously because I believe that they understand the consequences of war, whereas as a civilian, they often don't, and they lead us to war ignorantly. And so as I, as I think about this, as I look at the people in history, I, I analyze their writings, both Christian, non-Christian, I think most writers, most historians, most anthropologists, they all agree, war is hell. War is horrible. It is to be avoided at all costs. Then why are we so passionate about it? Why is it when governments begin to beat the drums of war, we so quickly run to them? It's the very reason these people followed these fake messiahs and why in A.D. 70 Jerusalem fell. And it is one of the most blood-stained historic moments in Jewish history. Jesus said, if you only knew my way, this is the way, the way of peace. Yeah, but Jesus, no. This is the way. But do you understand? This is the way. So are you trying to say, this is the way? There is no other way. It is the way of peace. And like humans have always done, they go their own way. And I firmly believe that just as Jesus wept, he continues to weep. Because we as people continue to beat the drums of war. When I was reading this text, I also came across the Pharisees. You know those Pharisees, they're always messing everything up, always putting their nose in where it doesn't belong. And, and as they're listening to all this, it says in verse 39, Luke 19, and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And I'm thinking, you know, that's just them being mean. They're always mean to Jesus, right? Well, there was other reasons historically. And here's the part of the story that we don't often meet. How many of you have heard of a guy by the name of Herod Antipas? He's famous in the scriptures. He beheaded John the Baptist. Do you remember him now? See, he was up in Galilee. He's the Tetrarch in Galilee, one of four of, uh, um, of the king, Herod the Great. He had four sons, and he had the area of Galilee. And on this day, because it's Passover, he is coming down with his royal guard, He's coming down with all of his soldiers, and they are marching down from the north into Jerusalem. There are nearly a million Jewish people, and if there was ever going to be insurrection or revolution, it is now. So Herod Antipas gets all of his soldiers ready, and they march into the city from the north. And if you can imagine, here comes Herod Antipas riding on a horse, and he has his banners, and he has his trumpets, and he has his drums, and he has his soldiers in full battle armor. And they're coming into town from the north. From the west, you have Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea. He brings his royal guard. He brings a thousand soldiers. He brings his banners, his trumpets, his drums. And they're coming in from the other side. Another thousand soldiers. They're going to go up to the fortress of Antonia. And they are going to establish perimeters in and out of the city. Because if there was ever going to be insurrection or revolution, it would be now. And both of these huge parades of military might have a political point. If you so much as think, about revolution, we will destroy you. One parade coming here, another parade coming here, 
a million people in the center. And who's coming up the other way? Twelve disciples and a man riding a donkey. Three parades and the crowds are watching. And here you have one of the most impressive moments. And I believe that's why the Pharisees, they go to Jesus and say, Stop this. Do you know what's going to happen? If somebody goes and tells Herod, if someone goes and tells Pilate that these people are calling you king, do you realize what's about to happen if word gets to them or if they see any of this procession? Not only do we know, they know also what's about to happen. Are you really trying to kill us all? And so they were very passionate about, stop this. And what's always really just brought my attention to the glory of God is Jesus' response. He says, no. He says, don't you know what this moment is? This is a historical moment where Jesus is going to go into his Passion Week. And here is something that I can't preach on now, but it is, it is a beautiful topic to think about. That Jesus came. Remember what I said about the donkey? A donkey that no one has ever ridden. Jesus is sitting on the donkey, and the donkey is obeying every command. And what Jesus is doing is he's making a political statement. He's also making a theological statement. He's saying, even the natural world is under my control. I am King Jesus. And if you will not worship me, if you will not praise me, nature itself will worship me. You shut all these people up. Don't talk to me when it starts to be, when there start to be earthquakes when the ground and the rocks themselves start shaking, that's who I am. Yes, there's an Antipas. Yes, there's a Pilate. But I am King Jesus, and I am establishing my kingdom. And it is right what people say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so this is a real hotbed of activity. And Jesus is establishing himself as king. But even as he's doing that, he's brokenhearted because these people, they're not getting it. They, they want war. They don't understand Jesus' way of peace. And so I, I took some time and I'm thinking, okay, if it's not natural for us to, I mean, why do we respond the way we do with war? How can we submit to our king? How is it, I mean, how many of you would agree with this statement? The world is in conflict right now. We've always been in conflict. We've never not been at conflict. We've always been at war. Then how can we obey Matthew 5? How can we be peacemakers? And I ask the question, well, okay, how can I fit? Why are we this way? When someone cuts you off on the road, why do you cuss at them? And I know you do cuss at them. Why do we respond with violence? Why do we respond with anger? James actually helps me a little bit. He says in James 4, 1 through 3, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And what he's saying is, the reason we're at war and in conflict so much is because we're individuals. No two people think alike. Amen? And it is very hard for people to unify about anything. How many of you like vanilla ice cream? Raise your hand. How many of you like chocolate? Which one's better? See, I almost caused a church split. We can't get along at any time. And I want to use the definition of conflict. The angry disagreements between individuals or groups. Is this what we see in our world today? The angry disagreement between individuals or groups? Yes or no? Yeah. See, there's something about, and there's a doctrine on it. It's called the, the, the doctrine of total depravity. And it says that everything we are, everything we think, everything we do is tainted by sin. And sin has its way because of our passions. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, you know. So, so it's our passions, how we feel emotionally, how we respond to things. And if, if someone walks up and offends you, then you will be offended and you will respond in like manner. 
And so when, when we know that these are issues, how can we be peacemakers? One of the things I've shared with people is in the world there's peace lovers. There's people who say, let's have peace at any cost. And basically they are doormats and they will let anybody do anything as long as nobody fights. And that does not work because that peace never comes. There are peace keepers, for instance, I went to Somalia, Africa. I went to Southwest Asia. I was in uh, Jebel Ali in Saudi Arabia. I was in different places and I was called a peacekeeper. And the reason I was a peacekeeper is because I had more guns and bullets than anybody else around me. And as long as I'm there, everyone will obey. And boy, do I have some stories that haunt me to this day. So I can be a peace lover, I can be a peacekeeper, but that's not what Jesus said. He says, I'm not looking for peace lovers. I'm not looking for people that will accept anything, any way, just so there's peace. I'm not looking for people to punk everybody else out. The might makes right. No. I'm looking for peacemakers. That is different. It's the way. And so I'm trying to put this together. And, and, and I, have, I have some thoughts I want to share with you. So in, on Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights, I teach a Bible study. And we've been going through the book of Esther. And I noticed something. Just, just some, I had some really great conversations last night just talking through this sermon. And, and, and I recognized something. As I study the book of Esther, how many of you remember the, the, the protagonist, the bad guy in the book is Haman? He's actually a symbol of Hitler. I don't know if you know this. But, but allow me to read to you just a little passage in the book of Esther chapter 3. This caught my attention. Haman hates the Jewish people. The Jewish people are in the Persian Empire, and they're getting along swell with everybody. Everyone's at peace. But listen to what Haman does. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instructions to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children. In, a, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by the order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa, the citadel. And the king and Haman, the bad guys, sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. What's happening? Long story short, Haman wants to kill the Jews, so he uses, ready for this word, social media documents, posters, and speeches. And he begins to go to peace-loving people and he says, listen, there is a day coming and we need you to turn in your neighbors. Those neighbors that your kids play together, they go to school together, you guys have dinners together, we need you to turn them in. We need you to be patriots to the Persian Empire. We need you to do your civic duty. We need you to turn them in in and the city was in confusion they they weren't with the program they're like why but these letters continued to go out and the letters and the posters and the speeches were all the same these people are different than you these people have different cultures they have a different language they have different values they have different skin color they have different uh feasts that they participate in they are not like us and because they're not like us, they're against us. And we need to get them before they get us. And you need to hate them. And if you continue reading in the book of Esther, those letters and those documents and those posters and those speeches, they make it happen. Neighbor began to turn in neighbor. And I asked in the Bible study when we were in this portion of Scripture, is that possible today? Would today neighbor turn in neighbor? Would you turn in your neighbor? <coughs> Excuse me. At first, I didn't think it would be possible. But then we have the last three years to look at. And what I began to notice is something that happened in the book of Esther also happened during the Second World War, 1940. Remember I said Haman? is a precursor to Hitler. What did Hitler do? Hitler came to the German people after the fall of World War I and he promised them prosperity. He said, 
we're going to remake our country. I'm going to offer you the automobile, Volkswagen. I'm going to give you a house. We're going to build the Autobahn. We're going to, we're going to modernize our country. We're going to make our country great. There's only one problem. There's some people amongst us. They're different than us. They speak a different language, have different feasts. They, 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 they act different. Their culture's different. They're not with us. They're against us. As a matter of fact, they're the reason we're suffering so much. And what we need you to do is to point them out to us. And at a certain time, we will come for them and we will bring the final solution to our problem. And you know, as you study history, it wasn't the soldiers, it wasn't the German soldiers. It was neighbor turning in neighbor, doing their political civic duty. Because their social media. Hitler gave us the very first documentary triumph of the will he started radio broadcasts and each and every day people were being told they're bad they're bad they're bad they're different they're bad children he gave special attention to the hitler the youth for hitler and every day they were being indoctrinated to say hail hitler over and over and over if your parents don't say it when you get home turn them in if your siblings won't say it when you're in your house turn them in if your teacher does not say it in classroom turn her in every day hail hitler hail hitler hail hitler and and they were making their minds we are us they is them they are different they are different they are different they are dangerous they need to die in esther social media Second World War, social media. Question, what do you see today? You see, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent. The moment you take a side in this present culture, you can't just disagree, you must hate the other side. Have you seen the YouTube video? Have you seen, have you heard the speeches? If someone is MAGA, you must hate them. If someone is a socialist liberal, you must hate them. You must hate immigrants. They're aliens who are invading our country. You must hate these racist people. They're bad people who hurt people. You, you must hate the police. You must hate the citizens. All we're getting each and every day is the drumbeats of war and conflict. And there's got to be something in the Christian heart that says, let's open our eyes. And let's recognize what the enemy is doing to the people. Kingdoms are presently clashing. So much so that I don't know what the result of this sermon online is going to do for our church. My voice may be shut down because I'm not saying the right things. I'm not appeasing my Republican friends, my Democratic friends, my immigrant friends, my not immigrant friends. Folks, can you see? That the world is constantly being put into a position to hate one another. And Jesus weeps and says, if you only knew the way for peace. Well, pastor, does that mean I'm not allowed to? Does that mean? We'll talk about that, okay? Can we just agree on this? And it's going to hurt some people to say this. But I believe it with all my heart. Jesus, God, is anti-war he is fully against war does that mean that war isn't necessary no sometimes it is necessary sometimes there's a moment where you need to reach for your guns there's a moment to respond but the baseline and the foundation is that it's not the way it isn't and I'd love to have more conversations. Look at history. The Korean War, Vietnam War, World War I, World War II, the war in Saudi Arabia. I can share with you the things that I've seen personally and the things that others have written about it. Peace. The word peace, peacemaker, is in Greek, it's the word Irene. Anybody here by the name of Irene? If you do, you have a beautiful name. It means peace in Greek. In, in Hebrew, it's, as I mentioned earlier, shalom. Irene and shalom. And it does not mean, listen to me, peace does not mean the absence of conflict or violence. What it means is the presence of God. Let me say this again. Biblical peace is not the absence of violence or conflict. It is 
the presence of God. And so if we're going to be Christ followers, following His way, then what we do as we encounter our world, no matter what the world or culture is doing, we bring Jesus into it. And peace in the word of Shalom or Irene is taking two things that have been torn apart and you bring them back together and make them whole. Being a peacemaker is not winning the war. Being a peacemaker is making people whole. That's why we as individuals, when we come to Christ, the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, that we have therefore been justified in Christ. We are no longer His enemies, but we have made peace with God. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 says that when we, when we are no longer God's enemies, not only do we have peace with God, but we have the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. It is the way. And as I'm, I'm going through the, these scriptures, I, I'm not only doing this theologically, politically, just reading and studying, but there's things in life, and I know I'm going short on time here, but there's things that really help me come to some conclusions. See, I was in the Marine Corps. I went to Southwest Asia. I was in Saudi Arabia. I did take up arms. I was a soldier. And if you had spoken to me back then in my younger years, I would have said a lot of things that I won't say today. You see, I, I still had 9-11 fresh on my mind. And all I could think about, if you were to ask me, and I'm going to be up front with you, if you had an Arab person in front of me, I hated them. They represented something very different than me. And so it wasn't very hard for me as a soldier to do my patriotic and civic duty, whatever that meant. And in my mind, I began to think, everybody who is there, everybody who is different, I can't trust them, I need to be watchful for them, and when I'm commanded, I will do my duty. And I will do it well. And so later on, when I began to see, and, and this, maybe I watch too much movies, but I'm going to share with you two movies that really messed me up. One of them was a movie that came out, I think it was 2013, Lone Survivor. Have any of you seen that before? If you haven't, you want to. It's an interesting movie. This is a true story. Uh, it's about a Navy SEAL team that was brought into Afghanistan, and um, they were led by one guy named Marcus Luttrell. Uh, so this Navy SEAL team comes in, and their job was to, to uh, assassinate a Taliban leader. But the mission went awry, they couldn't do it, and they were trying to extract out of the location in the mountains. But some goat herders saw them, reported it to the Taliban. Taliban came in, overwhelming numbers, overwhelming attacks. They ended up killing all of the Navy SEAL team, minus one, Marcus Luttrell. And he shares his story that he was found by some Arab uh, um, people in the area. And at first he was wanting to kill them, he was trying to defend himself, but they took him to their village, they patched him up. When the Taliban came for him, they defended him with arms. They went to war with their own people in order to protect him. They sent people to go and notify the U.S. soldiers. The soldiers came and they got him and they extracted him and that town paid the penalty later for having helped an American soldier. And in my mind, as a veteran, I'm thinking, that, that blows me away. I thought all of them were bad. And if it wasn't for these people, he would never have lived. And it wasn't just religiously. Uh, there's another movie, and somebody has to help me here. I know, I know we're supposed to be formal in church, but uh, not Heartbreak Ridge, another movie recently came out. Hacksaw. And it's about a young man who is a conscientious objector, and he's a Seventh-day Adventist. And if you had asked me earlier in life, a Seventh-day Adventist, well, you know they're all going to hell. All those heathens. And then I see this movie about a real man and what he did, his belief in God, how he cried to God, how he served the Lord, and the Lord blessed him. I was in shock for over a week, like, God used a Seventh-day Adventist? What's this world coming to? Apparently, God isn't a Baptist. Something's going on. And little by little, as I see true stories of true people, I began to realize how narrow my view was. 
And I began to examine all the messages that I, as a Latino, hear. A couple years ago, I met, with, I met with Vice President Pence here in the Valley. And I was fortunate enough to spend some time, and my picture made it on social media. There was well over 100,000 comments. 99% of them were horrible comments. I'm a traitor. I'm a horrible person. I'm a fake. I'm not even real. And I'm thinking, I, I, I didn't do anything wrong. Why are over 100,000 people hating me? Because I'm supposed to hate the white guy. And I began to have my eyes open little by little about how the drums of war are constantly bringing into light this, this ideology that we're supposed to hate each other. I know I'm going over a little bit, but this is important. Folks, listen to me. God doesn't want us to hate each other. God does not want us to kill each other. God does not like it when people go and hurt policemen. God doesn't like it when policemen hurt people. God doesn't like it when Democrat, Independent, or Republicans hate one another. God doesn't like it when we do violence to one another. That is not the way. That is not Christ's way. That is not the way of the city of the peace, or the prince of peace, or the king of peace, or the dove of peace. Peace is the way. And even though it's not a popular topic to say, it is the way. The way of peace. I want to end this sermon by sharing with you something. And this soothed my soul like you wouldn't believe. It helped my soul heal when I think about people in the Middle East. I'm going to show you a video. Let's go ahead and play this video. And it is a church service. It is 70,000 brothers and sisters who happen to be in Egypt. Just embrace this for a moment. Can you turn it up a little bit? Let's go ahead and stop it there. These were the people that I thought were my enemies. Those are my brothers and sisters in Christ. These are the people that you never hear about. This is the church in the cave in Egypt, in Cairo. Do you realize that there are brothers and sisters in Christ in Syria, Iran, Iraq, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, that we're never allowed to know we're always made to believe that we're few and that we're embattled and that everything is against us. No, we are many and we are mighty because we have King Jesus and he's leading us in his way. And for us to be peacemakers and to identify ourselves with Jesus, that's what makes us children of God, that we're following his way in his kingdom. And we are being called in a day of social media frenzy of hate to be peacemakers. Wherever you see hatred and anger, bring Jesus into the picture. Speak peace. Make things whole. Be strategic. Be smart. Be ready. And share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? I pray that you don't hate me for the things I've said. And I pray the Holy Spirit at least enlightens you and opens your mind to some of the things that you may feel in your heart.
Can I share one more thing at great risk to myself? How many of you know that politicians lie? I know, I know, it's a surprise. Everything I've seen in the last two weeks online is disgusting and it's garbage. What politicians are doing, the, they don't even hide their lies anymore. This is the world we live in. And it's time for us, the children of God, to stop listening to politicians. Stop listening to leaders that beat the drums of war and to follow Jesus in the way of peace.